Good morning to you. Welcome to Asake Online. My name is Zenzel Ndevele and this is the Breakfast Club. We hope you enjoyed your, your Christmas and Lihambilela when you saw Wolabangane. And of course, you were drinking responsibly for those who were drinking. So we, we just hope that we are not going to drink the holiday and forget that there's a new year and life continues. And today, uh, this is our first episode after uh, the Christmas uh, break and uh, we still intend to bring you different programs talking about different issues and today we are lucky to be talking to Professor Lindiwe Nkala Magaya. She's based uh, in the United States and of course now that it's holiday we also had the chance to uh, have a chat with her. She's, uh, I'll, I'll describe her as a child soldier and maybe she can uh, disagree with me but she joined the, the liberation struggle at an age of uh, 11 in 1977 and we want to hear a story the story you know, being a child soldier going to Zambia, what were the experiences and of course later on she has written a book uh, called The Guarded One, A Child's Journey Through uh, the War, I'm sure. Uh, and it's, it's, it's quite interesting that uh, we, we find people you know, writing books now, talking about their experiences, which makes our history of the liberation struggle rich because we can now compare uh, different uh, narratives and uh, different uh, viewpoints and we can discuss. Welcome to the program, Professor. Thank you. Um, I, I, I know we, we want to talk about the book and uh, uh, just explore, you know, what was going through when you're writing a book. But I want to start where it all begins. Uh, tell us about your background. Where are you born and when? Right, I was born in 1965 in December. I was born uh, in Gwanda Reserve, Sengezane. I'm sure some of you may know the place. It's just uh, about 50 or so kilometers away from Gwanda, Gwanda South. Uh, I was born uh, by, my dad's name is Jonathan, Jonathan Gala, and my mother is Tabiso Mabanga. So we lived in Sengazane at the time, but uh, we also did most of our, li of our living in at Rose Camp um, in Bulawayo. So was your dad a police officer? My dad was a police officer. Uh, just when he was uh, when I was born, he was already a police officer. He had been a police officer for quite a, quite some time during the Smith uh, regime. So, um, a police officer in Smith ends up going to war. Uh -huh. What motivated you to to go? Yeah, it, it, it. If I can start from the beginning, uh, my dad. Since my dad was a police co officer at the time, there was a conflict. So he didn't know, I mean, it was very difficult for him to be a police co officer and also belong to uh, the Zapu party at the time. So it was that conflict. So as a result, we, he resigned. And because he resigned while, I was, while his children were still young, so that made it very difficult for his family. So he resigned from the police, actually we are called it resigning or retiring. And then we went to live at Sengezane, at the village. And once we lived at the village, uh, it was difficult for him to do something else. So he, you know, he became a, an alcoholic, actually, because he didn't know what else to do. And my mother was a teacher. My mom decided that maybe moving from Sengezane, where our relatives were, would be the best plan. So we moved to another village further south, which is called Sukwe. It was in Sukwe that the war started picking up. And we, you know, as children at the time, some of us didn't actually know what was going on. We, you know, we could just hear about the war, but not really make sense out of it. Yeah. So it was that time that uh, most people, some villagers were starting to go to Zambia and we would hear about Joshua Nkomo, but it, we didn't know who he was. So how do you end up in the war yourself? Yeah. So how I ended up in the war is because uh, at the time they were the, the zebra uh, soldiers or guerrillas were taking people and others were going voluntarily. But in my situation, they actually came and took all the several villagers, actually, a lot of villagers. I think we were over 500 and 600 uh, children and adults. So they took the children at night and some during the day. And we crossed, it took us two days actually to cross over to Botswana. So, 
that's how I ended up in the war. So you 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 go to Zambia. Yeah. Were you excited? Were you looking forward to it? Uh, you have yeah. lots of you just being you know led to Botswana. Right. How is the atmosphere? Right. So what happened was it was on a Friday night. I still remember the date on 30th September 1977. Uh, my cousin and I actually were sleeping in our hut. Um, and then we heard noises, actually. The, the, the dogs kept barking and barking and we wondered what was going on. After a while, uh, the, we heard a knock and we wondered what it was all about. And then I heard some voices. Uh, my dad, actually, they were talking to my dad and they asked us to open the door. So my dad opened our, our heart door and then we got out and we were told that we were leaving and they asked my father to give us money because he was not going to see us again. So there were three uh, guerrillas at the time who came in and took us. So they marched us out of the, the village, out of the, our, heart, our house, uh, I mean our uh, homestead. So it was my brother and we had actually we lived with a, a, a pastor so it was my brother, my pastor, our pastor, and uh, one of the guys who lived with us, uh, my cousin and myself. So it was five of us. So they matched us so that we could also uh, get other uh, villagers as well. So five children, yes. uh, five people are leaving the homestead to the war. Yes. You know, do you remember how your father reacted when you guys left? Uh, our father was okay because they said to him, old men, give uh, the children money and bid them farewell. And my father said, yeah, that's okay. See you later. But my mother, on, on the other hand, was not allowed at the time to get out. So my mother was uh, really scared because already she had lost, uh, not lost, but uh, two of her children had already gone and left. Um, so my dad was saying, well, that's okay because he had already left the, the being a policeman and he was now a villager. Uh, maybe just for now, maybe just fast forward to 1980. Right. In your homestead, the people that you left with, yeah. did all of you return from the uh, Most of us did, yeah, but some uh, became soldiers and uh, others died during the bombardment. One particular guy that comes to mind, um, there was a bombardment that was made at Freedom Camp in Zambia, and he died there. Others died at, there was one uh, in Kench, um, called the Zambezi encampment. Uh, he died there as well. But your brothers managed to My reset. brother managed, yeah. In my, yeah. I lost my sister, actually, but it wasn't during, uh, during the, the bombardment. Um, she was supposed to be at Mkoshi, one of the camps that was, was bombed, uh, but she managed, for some reason, she was at the camp that wasn't bombed. But later on, she felt very sick and she died. So she, you know, she could make it. So you, you, you get to Zambia, where do you go? So we get to, first we go to Botswana and we lived in uh, Selibe Pipe. It was a camp for... Uh, for, I think it was a camp for uh, women that had been a prison, right, for women. So we stayed there from September, October, November, January, and end of January we were taken to Zambia so that we could open a school and start schooling there. Because we'd, we, I was in grade six when I left uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, so uh, once we got to, Bots or to Zambia, then we were able to start schooling. How, how is the, the environment in Zambia? How, I mean, you want to go to war, right. you end up in a school. Right. And how is the school? Yeah. Um, it, was, it was a very difficult situation, I must tell you. Um, so we got there, we're thinking we're going to school, and we found that it was actually a camp, right? And we had to do exercises, we had to wake up very early in the morning uh, for parade, and we had to, you know, to, you know uh, do the exercises that uh, trained personnel would actually do. There's one particular one, we call it a notorious one, called exercise number nine, whereby you, 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 you leap like a frog. So, yeah, the situation was very tough. Uh, even food, we couldn't eat uh, as much as we wanted. Uh, sometimes we would eat only once a day because there were so many of us. Yeah, but, you know, so many organizations donated food, so that really helped. Uh, it once a day, would have meat once a, a week, 
and maybe a piece of meat once a week. Uh, and we lived in tents, uh, as you know. So it was tough, it was very difficult. Yeah. So this is uh, from 1978. Right. Up, up, up until 1980. Yes. So you spent two years in Zambia. Yes. So these two years you are at school. Two years were in school. Yes. Were in school, but we are facing threats from the uh, the Smith uh, government uh, constantly, uh, to such an extent that sometimes, if we didn't hear uh, gunshots, would ask the the our guards to actually shoot so we could actually hear the gunshots. It was that uh, to that extent. And we also lived um, in uh, pits, so we made some pits so we could uh, live in, the, in those pits. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are seasons, there's winter, there's rainfall. Yeah. What happens during the rain season? Yeah, we, we just survived. Funny enough, we, I don't remember most of us being sick, so I guess we adapted to the environment. Uh, the, we had so many donors that gave us clothing and blankets, um, so we were able to use whatever we could in the shoes uh, that we had. Yeah, we, we survived. So the school, what are you learning? And yes. What was the, the class environment like? Right. At first it was mostly political, so that we could understand the system, uh, what we're fighting for. Because as I said, most of us didn't know what was going on, because we're still too young. Uh, so they, they, we had commissars who were able to teach us about the political structure, about the reason for the uh, for the struggle that we did not understand. So at first that was the situation. And then uh, they started building the schools, uh, the school uh, with buildings and with classrooms. That's when we started to get into the classrooms. And we used the Rhodesian uh, curriculum. So actually I, I we did our grade seven, we took the exams just like everyone else. But in the meantime, we're also being threatened uh, uh, for being bombarded, yeah. So 1980, they ceasefire, 1979, where do you go in 1980? So I came here in 1980, end of uh, 1980, and we were taken to Wanezi. Uh, my group was taken to Wanezi. Others went to take one in different schools, but I was in Form 1 at the time. So Form 1, 2, and 3 were taken to Wanezi to open uh, the school. So I finished in my Form 1, and I later went to Njube High School to complete my Form 2 through 4. Yeah. So how is the integration? You know, you're coming from the war yeah. and all the situation, you're back in the community, yeah. now you're there, yeah. you're now back to yeah. your parents' home, yeah. and you're now under authority of your parents. Yeah. How is that transition? It, it was difficult, because you felt like uh, you did not belong to that culture. You didn't know anything yet. This was your culture, these were your people. Uh, you felt like you did not belong. Uh, I think also because we had so much trauma, we needed you know, a situation where that trauma could be addressed. Um, people called us refugees and that was very painful because now we are seeing, well, I've been a refugee, I understand. When I was in Zambia and Botswana, yeah, I'm a refugee, but now I'm in Zimbabwe. Shouldn't I be part of everyone else? So we tried to remove the clothing that we have, tried to adjust so that we dress like, some, like everyone else and talk like somebody else, like everyone else. But our talk, obviously, was different. And our, because we spent three years there, so the way we talked, the way we, we behaved was different. But people could actually see that those are refugees, as they called us, or la baba bengeko, ababe sempin. So as a result, we tried to hide our, um, you know, our identity. It was, you know, a lot of people didn't even know that some of us were there. And I know in my family, um, my friends, some of them did not know anything. But for me, I was able to talk to them. Those were able to listen, to help me heal, uh, to help me integrate and be part of the, 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 the you know, the society. So you, you, you talk about uh, trauma, you talk mm -hmm. about healing. Mm -hmm. What was the major problem and obstacles that you faced, which yeah. led to this trauma that you needed healing. Right. Uh, the trauma is you're taken away from your family uh, to a land where you don't know whether you live or you'll not be able to live, to see your family again. 
So as a child, that's very difficult. And then we go to Zambia. In Botswana, you could say, well, we're close. You know, anytime you may go back. And you're living with a situation where you don't know where the, when the war is going to end. So I think that was the, very, the most difficult part. We didn't know when the war was going to end. Of course, they kept us motivated by telling us it will be end soon, 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 soon. So we kept hoping. So that really helped us that they would tell us that this is what is going on, this is what is happening, very soon we'll be free. So meanwhile, let's go to school. So that kept us also busy uh, because we're in school. But then we're facing threats. Anytime we could be bombed. Several times when FC was bombarded, uh, we, were to, we were to run out of our camp uh, to hide and uh, not knowing when the bombardment would take place. So we actually, actually some of us saw some jets that came to our, uh, our camp. So we still don't know. I was asking other Kijanas, other, other uh, children were there whether those were there to bomb us or they just been lost. So I don't know. Or maybe they saw children running away and they decided not to bombard. So we, we, I don't know about that. Uh, but as a child, you see that, you tell yourself that today I'm dying. I remember telling myself that, okay, today is my dying day. Yeah. So, so you're now, I mean, you're at your age, you're looking back mm -hmm. and uh, looking at the kids who are being recruited. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with the policy that Zipra was doing of recruiting mm -hmm. children to the war? Yeah. Um, they told us that the reason they were doing that is so that they could cripple the economy by taking the children. So up to today, I cannot figure out whether uh, that was something good to do. Yeah. Because I don't even know what happened to my parents. When I came back, they did not even want to talk about it. So... Not only I am, I, am I traumatized, my parents are traumatized as well. So I'm not really sure whether taking children was a good strategy, but maybe they know what they were doing. It was very difficult because there's so many of us there, so much that took place. Maybe if we had come back and received the support, uh, therapy, and the financial support, maybe that could have been justified. So yeah. you, have, uh, you have kids in a camp, yeah. uh, minimum supervision. Right. What were the chances of abuse? Uh, to be honest, with us children, maybe the abuses were there, but we were kind of protected. But I don't know about the adults. So the adults probably may tell a different story. So this story, I'm telling it from my perspective as a child. We were uh, protected. Uh, maybe there, were, there may have been a few situations where we could see a pregnant child. Uh, I cannot remember very well. Uh, but adults, yes, we could see people pregnant. And as children, we wondered, because I don't remember seeing guys around. Uh, we see those who protected us, were supposed to protect us. Those are the ones that we saw. Uh, but most of them were out of the camp. So that came as a surprise to us. We see people were pregnant. So, but as children... I, I mean, I'm talking from my perspective, but maybe others may have a different perspective. We're protected. We actually lived a, in a separate camp within the dormitories with adults who took care of us. Yeah, but the others lived in camps. So as I'm saying, they may think, oh, you don't know, girl, yeah. what happened. Yeah. 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 But, you know. So after some time, you, you eventually decide to write a book. Yes. Um, what led you to then say, I want to write a book about right. this? I've always wanted to write a book uh, about the experiences, and also because I have a very good memory, so and and trauma too was part of it, because there are situations where I would be sleeping, and then they'll come back, and sometimes I'll cry, uh, when thinking about those situations. So I figure that if I can write a book, maybe I'll take that trauma out. Uh, but the problem was time, and then it so happened that in 2020. Uh, because I'm a professor, I was given a sabbatical leave uh, from August to December. And I was supposed to do some research here in Zimbabwe. And then I thought, well, since uh, 2020, there was COVID. And then I asked if they could um, maybe uh, defer it to 2021. So in 2021, they said, yeah. And I said, well, let me take it now. I know it's, COVID is still there, but I'm able to travel. So while I was waiting for Zimbabwe to open its borders a little bit so that I could come in, so I, I said, well, 
Meanwhile, let me be writing the story. I don't know how far I'm going to go because I don't have my time. In general, I go back to, to work. So I decided to write the story. At first, I was just writing a novel just to keep myself busy uh, because I'm just used to being busy. And then I said, nah, I've always wanted to write my book, my story. So let me see if I can write it. Uh, actually, I wanted to write part, I, uh, I was going to have it as in two parts. So I wanted to write part one first. And so I wrote the first part, uh, which uh, lays a foundation for what I'm just writing about uh, so that, you know, the story is complete. Uh, so I started writing that book. Um, and then I was able to come to Zimbabwe where I was relaxed and I was motivated by the environment to hear the birds uh, singing, just the clear sky. That really helped me to be able to write it. I wrote the first part. But when I went back to the United States, I said, this book is not complete. I need to complete it. So I was able also to complete it and write the whole book. So in this book, what are you writing about? What are you telling us about? Right. So in this book, um, I start from the beginning. I was born in 1965. And history tells us that uh, the War of Liberation started in 1964. So that means I was actually born during that time. So I write about my family, how my family was affected. Um, because my story also is a story for most Zimbabweans. A lot of Zimbabweans can identify with the story. So my family was affected because my father was a, a police officer um, during the time when the war was taking place. Uh, during the time of national, black nationalism, uh, it was very difficult for him to serve the minority uh, uh, government and also be part of his, uh, his, his uh, uh, culture. So I tell the story that uh, my father uh, had that conflict. So he decided to retire because a lot of police officers at the time were retiring uh, because they'll be sent in the front to fight against the blacks. So it was difficult for him and the blacks would label him as a traitor. Yet he knew he was not a traitor, he was part of them. But he was also working as a police officer. So he decided to retire. Once he retired, our family, because uh, it was his income that was helping us to, to go to school. So I write about that part and how does it affect my own mother? How does it affect our, our family, the whole family? So as a result, we moved to Gwanda, to Sukwi. Now we don't have a, a home. Uh, in, uh, in Bulawayo because we're living at a camp. We lived in Ross Camp where the police officers uh, were living. So we lived at Ross Camp. So after the retirement, we went to Sengezane, uh, which, is, which is my home village. Uh, so probably during that time, your mother is earns less because she's a woman and yes. the system promoted it. Yes. So, I mean, your father is right now looking at the situation would say he was a, a principled man yes. who decided to you know leave the police office work mm -hmm. because he wanted to be with his people and yes. we have seen right now there are a lot of police officers or soldiers who would mm -hmm. say i don't agree with the system but they'll mm -hmm. still be sent to go and beat up their people yeah, and exactly. they will not retire yes. i mean is he is your father still alive no he's he's passed on yeah but he, I, I call him a hero because of his sacrifice. He would just sacrifice his own family because he knew that there was, he, there's no way he can beat up his own people because of money, you know, because of a job. So he, he sacrificed and he retired. So, we, you know, he could support his own uh, the country. In a way, your mother played a big role as well because yes. she's now the one who's looking after the family when your father is working. I yeah. mean, uh, how does that affect her? Right. So my mother is affected in the sense that because now he's leaving, we're all leaving the, uh, we, we leave uh, Rose Camp to go to the village. He had a very good job. My mother was a, a, a teacher and he was a, 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 psychologi a psychologist. He worked at, um, a, what they call it, a, 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 a remand. Yeah. So he, she had to leave that place and go to the village. Now in the village, he, she had to look for jobs as a teacher. It was no longer permanent. So that affected as well. Um, and that meant leaving the children alone with some relatives to take care of them. And meanwhile, my father, uh, you know, because he's no longer a police officer, he's no longer the person who's helping other people. Now he's unable to help himself. So as a result, he becomes an alcoholic because he's going to the village where uh, most of the villagers spend their time drinking itototo. Uh, so now he's a villager now. 
And, but my mother, he says, no, this cannot be life. So my mother goes to teach at another village. And then he asked my dad if they could move to that village. So we moved to that village. So it's like we're getting closer to the border, to the Botswana border, for us to be able to, to travel to Botswana. So my dad follows there, and then we start a, another homestead in Sukwe. That's the second village. It was there that we were taken. I mean, my years back, uh, reflecting, mm. uh, do you have any regrets? I, no, I do not have any regrets. Um, because I did not do this myself. I was recruited with other children. Uh, but what I know is that that life has made me realize that one can achieve anything. To me, if that war ended, everything, anything else can end. Because I never thought the war could end. I never thought. And so now I, when I look at it, I also have compassion for people who are in difficult situations because I know what it is to go hungry. I know what it is to suffer. I know what it is to have trauma as a child. So as a result, it has made me stronger because I understand what suffering is. So you, you went to war, you saw the guys training and mm -hmm. all, uh, you know, the, 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 the army and all. So you, you, you would never at any point was inspired to be a soldier that you said, 1980, I want to join the army. No, there's no way I could have joined it because I had already experienced it as a child. And uh, no, no. I'd gone through trauma and I understand uh, the kind of trauma that they go through as well. Yeah. So for those who want your book, yes. finally, where, where can they get it? Yes, this book, um, it's on Amazon.com. It's online. You can get it. And if you need some copies, uh, there's a number that they can reach as well uh, if they need copies. Yeah. So I don't know if I can leave that number. Yeah, you can. Yes. It's 732-642-4808. Uh, uh, is it so a, that's uh, an American okay. yeah, yeah. number. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for taking time to, to talk to us. And yes. uh, we, we hope that uh, you continue writing. I'm sure you could not write all your experiences in one book. Yes. There's more. Actually, as I talked to most people who are also even involved in this book, I found that the conversation now is broader. Others were saying, maybe you should write a book about us, about what happened. Because as it is, I don't know what happened while I was gone. People never talked about these things. So that's one thing. And also, um, what, can, what was done for the children as they came back. So that's something that I really struggled with. I was fortunate enough to have parents who were able to take me. And to f the fact that I found them still alive. They were able to take me to school. What about those who did not find their, their, their parents? What about those who did not find support? Where are they? What was done to them? So, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this was uh, Professor Lindy Wenkala Magaya, and we're talking to her about her experience uh, joining the war as a child at 11 years, but also talking about the book that she has written, The Guarded One, A Child's Journey Through the War. And we hope that you also get a chance to uh, find the book and read and uh, enrich your experience. If you have uh, uh, many other people who are in the war, especially in the Zipra, and they want to tell their stories, uh, please let us know. We also want to reach out to those who are in Zandla, those who were uh, in the Rhodesian front. We want to get all the experiences. My name is Zenzel Ndebele. Till we meet again in other programs, have a good day.